What is up everyone, it is Quad Asha here. We are back with League of Legends Arcade Act 1 Part 2. So, uh, we are shown with a little intro um, the correlation between who owns the penthouse and the four that are going uh, through the penthouse, which is Vi and Powder and uh, Milo and Plagar, Plagar, however you pronounce his name. So I do like how right off the bat they're connecting episode one and episode two. So I wanted to give a fair warning that this video contains spoilers. So if you haven't seen the episodes, this is your spoiler warning. I would suggest you pause it, watch the episodes and come back here. If you like the video, that would be awesome to hit the like button down below. And if you dislike it, you can also hit the dislike button. Leave a comment. Let me know how I can improve, how I can be better, what you'd like to see, what you don't like to see. Because uh, I do plan on making these as the more episodes come out. So let's get right into it. Uh, we are going to be talking about some Easter eggs, some speculations, uh, a general overview of the episode. And I want to kind of go over some of the first character lines that we see between the new characters that are introduced. So in that scene, you have two new characters that are walking down the hallway, which is a young Kate and a young Jace. Kate's first line is... You really went to the Undercity to get these, weren't you afraid? So this does answer my question on the first video. Jace is the one that went to Benzo's shop and bought the trinkets from Echo, which is actually what they're holding in this episode. But also shows a sense of fear and um, classism. Classism or word? Classism. Yeah, classism. Yeah. So yeah, by her asking, weren't you afraid is a sense of classism because not only does Kate and Jace belong to Piltover, which believes that they're better and above Zahn, uh, Kate also belongs to a very wealthy and rich household. So that even increases her status. Uh, I love Jace's first line and his response to her question. A little danger is worth the risk, don't you think? A little danger is worth the risk, don't you think? And that is shown that he doesn't necessarily care about the different classes between Piltover and Zahn. He cares more about the human race and wants to make it a better place for everyone. He knows the beauty of Hextech magic and he wants to show the world that. Also, I believe that since Jace doesn't belong to a wealthy household, he's kind of more of a common household in Piltover. He doesn't have that much classism instilled in him. He kind of sees the people of Zahn and probably himself as very similar just trying to survive and make it through to the next day uh, but in this next scene we are going to see what we saw in the intro of this video also how it connects more to the first episode as you can see it, it is a even younger Jace with his mother trudging through the snow as you can tell she is uh, affected by the cold um, as she has frostbite on two of her fingers and appears to be uh, dying of hypothermia the the location where they're at seems to be somewhere at Freylord, which is like in the north northwest area of Rotera, where it's full of mountains and snow, and it's very very cold there. I have seen some places mention that them walking through the snow is a representation of how they are a lower class and they are trudging through Piltover, trying to survive and make a life for themselves. But it's very difficult, and that Jace is eventually Jace and his mother are eventually saved by magic and hex. We are introduced to a figure the mage uh, I have not heard any definite answer of who this is from what I understand it is not rise and I would agree with that one rise doesn't really use a staff to create his magic and rise is also a blueish purple color and this person has a normal skin tone flesh flesh that was a weird way of saying that no a normal skin tone put like that jeez but they do create a, a portal makes them go from this cold harsh winter area to more or springtime meadow again signifying that hex tech magic will bring the family from their struggle into a life of paradise and spring but who is this mage i would like to say it's rise i'm not sure my other guess maybe rise's mentor tyrus of hell helena Hel Hel helia tyrus of helia who if you look at rise's lore is good and then turns bad um so it is a question of when does this episode take place in time compared to the rune wars is it before during or after because if it's after um tyrus does turn a little crazy 
crazy and Bryce has to defeat him so therefore it cannot be him. But it also could just be a random mage that just knows Hextech magic and it gives Jace the knowledge in some cryptic way that Jace has to now uh, decode and spend his life trying to figure out how it works. Uh, I do also have to say it's, it's interesting that they had these portals where now in this new season of League of Legends coming out, they're introducing the Hextech Dragon which also allows portals between the map of Runeterra uh, or the map of Summoner Rift. But I did notice two things. One, which this is not a speculation of any sort, but when the mage goes out to a zoomed out version and you just see his head and the stars or his eyes and whatnot, it does remind me of Dark Cosmic Jin, where the star on his top of the head kind of reminds me of the stars in this uh, part of the episode, but also it looks like the item that the mate gives to Jace is the tear of the goddess So that was a cool little little thing and 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 I, I did see that it is an item that Jace uses on Summoner's Rift quite often since he is pretty mana hungry in the earlier levels So we are back at Jace's penthouse where he is being interrogated by Grayson and the enforcers are rummaging through his stuff that is left over from the explosion We have a young man that is about the child board that says this line i believe someone should have said that earlier now if you didn't know uh this person is a victor my favorite character in the game of league of legends and uh he does look a little bit different uh i can't quite put my finger on it uh maybe you can help me out in the comments down below i believe someone should have said that earlier now i don't know if he's being sarcastic in this remark because later on in the episode um where he's talking to jace before he jumps out of the penthouse he says that when you're going to change the world don't ask for permission that would kind of contradict what he's saying here where someone should have told him to be more careful with what he is doing and asks for permission which is why he actually has illegal items which again makes sense why he is going to Zahn to buy trinkets from Benzo instead of getting items at a shop in Piltover mainly because they probably wouldn't have the illegal items or they wouldn't sell it to him because he is not authorized to use them Zahn doesn't care they just want the money so they'll sell whatever they can so here we are introduced to Heimerdinger the first Yordle on the show um, and he is the head of the council again also in charge of Victor or Victor is his assistant uh, but his first line is this imprisonment what a curious principle we can find the physical body yet the mind is still free and I think this is in reference to the power of the mind the world is able to kind of lock you up as best as they can tell you what you can and cannot do but the only thing they don't have control of is the mind um, and he says it is a conundrum a riddle which is something to be solved so it is almost as if Heimendinger would would prefer a world where people could have their mind controlled to not think certain things and not in an evil way probably wants to do it in a with a positive outlook as he mentions later on in the episode he has seen some terrible things in his 307 years of living on Runeterra he doesn't want people to succumb to the evil notions um, or d dangerous acts that can put others in harm he would rather have everyone think of safety and procedures and protocol than to live a wild and free life and that's what i think a lot of this episode kind of focuses on you can see a lot of correlations between jace and vi jinx and vi zon and piltover you do have a lot of that freedom and control and it's a very interesting spin that i do like and in this case jace is told in the prison cell to forget magic forget the freedom and wonderful stuff that he saw from the mage and to conform to what the council wants him to do and he will continue to live the life that he is living and it is something that jace has to decide whether or not he is going to conform to the council or if he's going to follow his heart and his dreams and free his mind and continue the study of hextech well, what's the matter milo you worried powder is going to beat you again hey if she didn't keep fixing these things, I wouldn't keep missing. We are back with Vi and her posse as they are laying low from the enforcers. Um, they are in a hideout where Vi is working out on her boxing skills and Milo is again complaining about powder. Um, I do like this scene, but I wanted to kind of point out behind Milo looks like to be either a mermaid or a serpent lady, uh, which could either be Nami, a reference to Nami, or a reference to Cassiopeia. Um, I don't know which one. It's kind of hard to tell from the, the head 
head it doesn't show too much but the tail does look like it can either be a mermaid or a serpent's tail um, also the guns that they are holding looks like to be the guns from misfortune as it does have um, a giant cylinder barrel similar to what misfortune uses when uh, she shoots her guns I love this scene because earlier Vi is shown to be boxing which goes with her character in the game who is a fighter uh, close quarters melee combat while Jinx in the game is the ADC which is someone that prefers to do damage from a distance with a ranged weapon and is behind the rest of the team she hits almost all headshots or damage dealing shots which is really cool but it looks like one of the last characters she's shooting at is a pirate um, and I would love to say that this is gangplank I'm not entirely sure could be um, kind of like his ghost skin that he has would be my best guess um, but it'd be, it'd be pretty cool if that is gangplank being shot with misfortune guns kind of more build water imagery and representation after Jinx demolishes Milo in the arcade shootout she moves over to an arcade machine that actually has a Teemo on it um, if you zoom up onto the screen it is cute and it is awesome um, I do love all the Teemo references that are around it is similar to like if he's in the game where you don't know where the next Teemo stream is lying and it could be your demise as the four are about to be attacked by the enforcers Vi lets the group know that they're gonna go run for some reason Milo decides to hop over the counter and shoot the enforcers with like nerf balls basically it does absolutely no damage to them he is uh, did not see us well enough to buy a strong item apparently and they <laughs> they just shrug it off but if you look at the top left corner it does look like a, a bear is drawn onto the wall I would assume that might be a call to Tibbers which is a bear or stuffed bear that Annie has in the game um, but yeah moving along when Jinx is trying to run away she is captured by the enforcer but she hits the arcade panel and the chomper chomps down onto the arm of the enforcer letting her go and she runs free again it is a reference to her ability flame chompers that will hold people in place and explode so now we have moved back over to Piltover and we are introduced to councilwoman Mel and she is a very rich and powerful person as stated in the scene but her first line is steady is stagnant and that for me shows that this woman does not want to just be stagnant she wants to keep progressing she wants to make sure that everything she's doing is the very best um, and she wants to make sure that wherever she's at is making her money and making her powerful um, this is shown throughout the scenes of her in it where she can kind of be somewhat of a manipulative woman as she is picking out a, a gift for another council member that it actually turns out to be a child's toy and she kind of gives it to the councilman as a gift for the sharpest of minds although she is the richest person in Piltover she wants to be more than that she wants something revolutionary something that's going to put Piltover on the map and this is I think going to be referenced in the future as uh, Jace is on trial she is very interested in what Jace has to say again she knows that the toy that she picked before is also a child's toy and she says it good because she knows that the councilman that she's going to give it to is not the uh, smartest of the bunch. The boy's got ambition. It's why we supported him in the first place. Ambition? Darling, he nearly blew up our daughter. Jace had nothing to do with that. He was robbed. So now we are introduced to the family of Kate as we see her mother and father and herself in a family portrait with classical music in the background signify that they are of a higher status. I can't say too much about their first line. That's not super important. But I do want to say um, the reference that is made between the picture and themselves in the household is very interesting. In the picture, they are very close together, somewhat in a loving manner, while in real life, they're very separate um, as the father is off on the left side. The daughter is off on the right side and the mother is looking into the mirror getting ready for Jace's trial. As well as the statement that the mother makes which is about their status with Jace. 
that it is more of a sense of obligation as patrons to support Jace rather than true belief in what he is doing. Even though they know that he has ambitions, they don't really know what those ambitions are, nor does it seem like they really care. Uh, I don't know if they support him in some way of getting gain back, whether through uh, respect or more status, or if Jace's contributions would somehow give them money. I, I don't know how the Society of Piltover would work. It seems that they are supporting Jace for more money or for more status, um, not necessarily because they believe in him. While Kate is different, Kate actually believes in Jace and believes in what he is doing as she was helping him carry some of his trinkets around. They have some sort of bond and relationship uh, that is uh, explained a little bit later on, but Kate wants to help Jace as opposed to where her family cares more about their status and their name and what their obligations to Piltover society is. I'm protecting our people. I'll do the same for any one of you. This is an amazing scene that contrasts the family difference between Piltover and Zahn. In Piltover, we just had a very noble and high status family talking and how they are very cold and distant from each other. While here in Zahn, we have a group of misfits that aren't even blood related, but are still family. And you can sense the loyalty that they have to each other. Vander says that it is our way to be family and to be together. And if we decide to go against Piltover, a lot of us will die and he doesn't want the people of the lanes to die he would rather everyone stay safe and stay together than to try to fight and he would to lose more of his family for your birthday counselor oh mel this is too kind. This is a very interesting scene that I saw in this episode where Mel is using a very nice gesture and a gift to the councilman uh, for his birthday, but it has a an undertone to it. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it to where it has, it, it's in a good heart, but she wants something in return. And that's what Piltover seems like it is in the society to where everyone gives each other gifts and it's all, it's all in good nature, but everyone wants some sort of of favor or status in return. As seen where the a gentleman is eating uh, some dinko nuts and he decides that he wants some favor, so he's gonna offer up a gift as well. Turns out the councilman is allergic, so it kind of backfires against him, but that is kind of what the society looks like it is doing where they give gifts in return for favors. Do you have anything to show for your work besides an explosion? As we know, Mel wants something revolutionary, something that puts Piltover on the map. And Jace just said that what he is creating is revolutionary. So now he has her interest. If you watch the scene in the entirety, she kind of controls the conversation just a little bit to where she gets the reaction from Jace that she wants, where he describes what he is doing. And also in the end, will save Jace from being exiled into um, out, of, out of Piltover so that he can continue his research in some way or another. The arcane is the curse of our world. My race was nearly destroyed by it. Now this council member that is talking is very mechanical, very robot-like, not very human. Now he does mention that he does have a race. I'm curious if they're gonna change Oriana's lore just a little bit and this is the race that Oriana will belong to, which is very mechanical, very clockwork-like. Um, in her lore, she's actually human and turned machine by her father. Very interesting, go read it. Uh, but It'd be interesting to see if they change her lore to where she has her own race. I've seen this power in the wrong hands. So this is where I think the Brune Wars have already taken place, which is why I then had to go back to my previous statement and say that the mage is just a random mage and is not Tyrus because Tyrus would have been defeated by Rise. But in this scene that Heimerdinger shows us, it is some man wielding a staff raising uh, into the sky. Is that Tyrus? I don't know. I also heard that it may be Karthus who also has a staff and bringing people to death, but because it has to do with runes and arcane and magic of that sort, I would assume it might be Tyrus who gets corrupted by this magic and arcane as he tries to control it, which is what Heimerdinger's warning is to Jace and to the council um, as they are debating on whether or not to allow this in Piltover or um, to just exile Jace. So 
Jace is now free to return back to his household, uh, but is no longer allowed to step foot onto the academy or uh, continue his studies of Hextech magic. Now we do move over to the uh, area of Zon again, where Marcus is meeting with Silco. And in the background, you can see some crab references. And I wonder if this is a reference to Urgot and his crab skin, as Urgot is a, a member of Zon. So it, it is possible that he may be somewhere looming in this area uh but also that he does have this really weird kind of crab skin i still remember the look on your face when you found these So quickly, we are in the house of Jace and his mother. And if you actually look at her fingers, you see that two of them have been replaced with mechanical fingers as she did lose some to frostbite. But we move over to the picture of Jace and his father, and he is holding his signature hammer. Uh, I'm wondering if the schematics that we saw in the first episode is what will change his hammer into the gun that he has. While here he has the hammer, he just wants to modify it with hex. Tech. Um, as well as on top of the picture, there are some metals and the one on the right looks very, very familiar. I'm not entirely sure of what it is, but it is something I have seen before, I believe. It almost looks kind of like the honor badges that you get, but I know it's not that. It's something else. Uh, if you do know what it is or have any ideas, just let me know down in the comments. Hello. If dangerous ideas didn't excite the imagination, we would never wander astray. Nonsense. It's far too unstable. Could you? So Heimendinger says if dangerous ideas did not excite the mind, then we would never wander astray. Which is what I was saying before in the scene where Heimerdinger is in the prison with Jace. That if Heimerdinger had the ability to control the minds of others and prevent anyone from doing dangerous ideas, it seems like he would. He doesn't want people to go astray. He doesn't want people to become dangerous. He doesn't want people to become evil and destructive. But Victor is very interested in Jace's theories and what is written down in his notes. Also, if you uh, were to look at the scenes before where Jace talks about Hextech to the council, he is very awe-inspired. So also in the end of the scene, he does take Jace's notebook. So Victor is very intrigued with Hextech and what it can do and the possibilities. Now, as we know, Victor does become all machine. And so it is something that I feel would lead to that. Victor is crippled, Victor is not as powerful, and Victor is only an assistant. That's not what he wants in his life. Victor wants to be fully able, he wants to be powerful, and he wants to be a scientist, a person that is revolutionary and wants to bring glorious evolution. There's a monster inside all of us. I'd like to let you in on a very important secret. So Soko mentions to Deckard that there is a monster inside all of us. And I think this is also a reference to Warwick, where later on Soko will somehow be able to take the good Vander, throw it away, and release the animal inside of Vander, which is Warwick. But as well as his mention of power. Power doesn't necessarily come to those that are born with it or given. It is given to those that are willing to do whatever it takes. This is a big idea that is explored through Zahn and through Piltover. They're not very different even though one it would be deemed more prosperous as the other. Uh, Mel is a, a good example of that. She has power in Piltover, but she doesn't have the power that she wants. She wants more power. So she needs to do something that no one else is willing to do in Piltover. She wants to bring magic. She wants to bring arcane. She wants to bring something revolutionary. She wants to do something that no one else is willing to do. Same thing with Silco. Silco wants Zahn to be prosperous and be powerful. And he wants to be powerful in Zahn. So he has to do something that no one else is willing to do, which may be having to fight Piltover, having to unleash the monsters inside of others so that he can, again, take over Piltover, um, and Deckard is also in that predicament. He wants to be powerful. He doesn't want to just be a grunt. He just got whooped by Vi and her posse. He doesn't want that. He wants to be able to be the one that whoops others. So he has to do something that no one else is willing to do, which is to take the vial and again, release the monster inside of him. Now I do find this scene kind of interesting where he, he does take the knife away from Deckard. Why does he do that? And it kind of brings me to the scene 
in uh, the Dark Knight where the Joker is holding the gun to his head and telling the person to shoot him while holding the hammer back so that he knows that even if the person was to shoot the gun, he would never been shot because he is holding the hammer from firing. I feel like Soko is kind of doing the same thing here where he is removing the weapon from Deckard uh, and telling Deckard that power is given to those that are willing to do anything. What if Deckard was to have this random urge to now kill Soko, which is something that no one else is willing to do, and take his power and his status? So Soko, being the genius that he is, removes that threat from the equation. Now that Deckard no longer has the knife to kill Soko, the only way that Deckard will be able to get the power that he wants is taking the vial. They won't see you. Your name's no good now. So why are you out here? I'm a misfit too, I suppose. So again, there's a lot of imagery in this scene where Jace is free and he is in Piltover, but by the shot, it seems like he is behind bars. He is locked away mentally. He is sad, represented with the rain, um, and he is in conflict of what he wants to do with his future. Does he want to risk studying Arcane and Hextech, or does he just want to conform to what the council said and just become a simple hammer maker? That would be later discovered in the future, but... Um, um, what is interesting is what Kate says, you know, your name is no good no more, which again is how the society of Piltover works, where your status is everything. If you don't have status, you don't have a say. And Jason no longer has a say. Um, he didn't have much anyways because he came from a lower house, uh, but now that status is even further removed. But what she says is also kind of interesting. She says that she's also a misfit. I'm, I'm curious on why she says that. Um, I don't picture her as a misfit but clearly she herself sees herself as a misfit and I'm wondering why she sees herself as a misfit. Maybe in act two we will see that, uh, but only time will tell. So the enforcers are now at the last drop and they're about to go and find the kids down below, but Vander uses a device to kind of warn them, which is the a monkey that we have seen over and over again with Jinx as far as in the in her theme and also in the trailer for Enemy with uh, Imagine Dragons in it. Um, it is also kind of like her calling card. She also has a card in Legends of Ruterra, Get Excited, that also has the monkey. This device is used to warn the kids, but then also becomes Jinx is warning to Piltover that she is here. As well as when the enforcer is looking through the room trying to find the kids, he looks under the bed and if you look closely onto the right of the, uh, underneath the bed, there is a rhino, which is actually the rhino that Jinx rides in her theme song. And then again, it kind of, um, once the enforcers leave and there's no sign of the kids, the next scene is Vi's rabbit. Um, again, I don't know what the importance of it, but it is shown over and over again. So the contrast between Vi and Jace is really, really interesting. We just had a talk with Vi and Vander, where Vander was explaining to her that it is not worth it to fight Piltover if she is willing to risk her family in losing them because no one wins in war. And then as Vi is holding her head down, we do hear the somber music, very similar to when she was being carried by Vander as a child, and she is looking into Piltover. Um, this is kind of her moment where she realizes, I don't want to lose Powder. I don't want to risk her dying. So I'm going to sacrifice myself to save her and it's a very noble and very loving thing to do Which is why you hear this nice music behind it then goes to the next scene where it's dark and it's the apartment of Jace Everything's destroyed everything's crumbling and he is looking over the edge contemplating whether or not he wants to jump and Again, he wants to sacrifice himself as well, but not in a noble or very loving way to help anyone or to prevent anyone from getting hurt. It's kind of more of a, a better off dead and no one's gonna care anyways, which is interrupted by Victor. Victor is there telling him about his story where he was in Zon, uh, but then, like I said before, he's crippled. He's only an assistant. 
He doesn't come from a fancy household and he doesn't have a patron supporting his research. But the one thing he did have was he had belief in himself. And that is what made Victor who he is. And he wants to share that belief with Jace because he believes in what Jace is doing. He is able to pull Jace away from the edge of the building and they sit down and they start talking about Hextech. I don't even know your name. It's Victor. You know, Powder, what makes you different makes you strong. So we started off with the contrast between Vi to Jace and how they were willing to sacrifice themselves for different reasons. Uh, and now we go back and we transition from Victor to Vi, where there are two people that have belief in themselves and belief in their family and they're willing to do something about it. Victor now believes in Jace and Victor is willing to sacrifice his career to help Jace achieve Hextech, while now Vi is willing to sacrifice herself for her family to keep him safe. This is represented when Vi takes the rabbit off the wire and gives it to Powder, representing that she is no longer waiting for the winds to knock the rabbit off the wires and she's in do it herself. And Powder does realize this, uh, which is why it puts her into a somber mood. <laughs> Vi is now alone in Benzo's shop waiting for the enforcers to pick her up while Powder is at the bar holding the stuffed rabbit. Vander does his very best to try to help her to cheer her up but once he realizes why she is holding the rabbit he himself is in shock and is in fear for Vi because he knows what she is going to do and he knows what is going to happen. So that is it for episode 2. Um, I do know that there wasn't as many Easter eggs as I would have liked, and I know it was a little bit longer than I was hoping for, uh, so I, do, I am thankful for those of you that have stayed and watched to the very end. It does mean a lot to me. I know that this episode did build a lot more on previous characters while introducing new characters and building upon those origin stories and talking about some very difficult topics uh, such as power, respect, status, uh, love, family, and sacrifice. And it's a little bit difficult to try to deeply analyze those topics within the time frame that I would like to be in. Um, plus, it's one of those topics that neither side really wins. Uh, if you look at Piltover, if you look at Zahn, there are two sides that think that they're doing the right things for their family and, their, and for their citizens. But if you look at it, neither one of them is necessarily right or wrong. It's kind of just in the certain mindset that you look at, at or you look at it uh, but with that being said i did enjoy this episode so much um, like i said it is a very deep deep episode with the contrast between the different characters such as vi jace victor and powder and the similarities between those characters make this episode even more dynamic and make this series a very very awesome series uh, i can't wait for the more episodes to come out and i can't wait till i start working on episode three so if you are interested in that don't forget to hit the like button subscribe comment all the fun stuff youtubers tell you about and until next time i shall see y'all later